On uh, Friday night, uh, we were studying a series on textual criticism. Now, that doesn't mean to criticize the Bible. It's kind of like one of these charismatics said. He said, uh, well, I'm just tired of apologizing for the Bible. Uh, these guys that talk about apologetics and the guys in ignoramus because apologetics comes from apologeo. Apo, L-O-G-E-O-M-A, apologeo, my. And that word apologeo means a complete logos or it actually is the word answer. When Peter said let uh, everyone should always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in him, that's where we get the word apologetics. It's an answer. Well, when we talk about textual criticism, we're not talking about uh, criticizing the Bible. May, let me make sure you understand that. We're talking about critiquing or examining the text. Now, you've got uh, two... Uh, two uh, texts that are in competition. There were many texts of Scripture. You had, uh, you had, they were all called codices or codex, C-O-D-E-X. C-O-D-E-X, that word means manuscript. Manuscript. A manuscript is a copy. When you, when we go back here on the copy machine, and we make copies of something, it is it would be a codex or a manuscript. The original, what was the original called when Paul wrote the original letter? And uh, what did they call that? Autograph. The autograph. They call that the autograph. When Paul wrote, when Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, the original letter was called the autograph because it had his signature on it, it in so many words. It had his writing on it. Even if it was Luke, uh, his, uh, Luke was supposed to be his secretary and the man who wrote for him. Well, these are called codexes, and we've got, you had, and they would name them after the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Aleph, Beth, and Gimel, and so forth, on down the line, and Daleth, they, that's what they named them, except, except they called them, they called them Codex A, uh, Codex A, Codex B, Codex G, Codex D. Now, the only two that we are really uh, concerned, well, there's three we're actually concerned with because the two most popular, not, not the two most popular Bibles, the most popular Bible in the world right now is the NIV. The one that it's in opposition to is the King James. Now, I'm not a King James only person. I use a King James Bible, and I use it for one reason. I use the King James Bible so I can go into the Strong's Concordance, and you've got all kinds of books numerically coded to Strong's. Probably one of my favorites, if I'm going to study, if I'm going to study... Uh, Old Testament is this right here. This is the theological word book of the Old Testament. This is a two-volume set. And this will give you something about the history of the word in the Old Testament Hebrew. It'll tell you that there were no vowels. There were vowel points, but there were not vowels. Uh, and uh, when you're going to look something up, what you do is you look up your Strong's number, and then it'll give you the corresponding theological word book number and then you turn in the theological word book to that number, and it will tell you uh, something about the history of the word, the background of it. If you want something on the history of uh, the history of the Greek, you have Kittle's ten-volume dictionary. It's ten-volume set of New Testament Greek words. You've got all kinds of of uh, Greek. Uh, I think I've got something up here. I thought I did. Yeah, here's a. Uh, You've got, these are numerically, in fact, I don't know if I've pointed this out to you, this is Jacinius lexicon, and if you're going to use a, if you're going to use the Strong's, the reason I use the King James is because most of, of what we have is numerically coded to Strong's. In fact, it says so right here. On the Jacinius, this is an Old Testament Hebrew Chaldean lexicon, and why does it say Hebrew Chaldee? Because the Hebrew language comes from the old ancient Assyrian language. Well, it says right here, numerically coded 
to Strong's exhaustive concordance. So what you do is you look up your Strong's number, and if you don't get a... Mr. Strong is going to give you a very, very limited definition. He doesn't have room enough in his Strong's to give you more than just a limited definition. So if you go in here in the Jusenius, either here, if you're wanting to really exhaust an Old Testament word, get both of these together, along with your Strong's, and take your Strong's, look up the word, and then go into this, go into looking up your Strong's number, and here you see that number? That's the Strong's number right there. This is the Strong's number here. When you see the, see the number here at the top of the page, 3008, that's the Strong's number, just like you have it in here. Well, if you're going to look up the Greek word, and you've got many Greek study books. I've got a Bowers lexicon. Now, that's not, that's not quote, coded to Strong's. You're going to have to know the Greek alphabet, and that's not hard. Uh, most people here know the Greek alphabet, and it doesn't take any time to do it. But this is also numerically coded to Strong's. You look up your Greek word. If it's a New Testament verse, it'll be in the Greek. If it's an Old Testament word, it'll be in Hebrew. You look up your Strong's number, and then you come over here, and maybe he'll expand on this. If not, then you can learn to get into the Kittles. You can learn to get into uh, uh, many other, Bowers and some others. And we've got all kinds of other Greek books. But you, you really need, if you're going to learn this, you need to learn your, your, your Greek alphabet. And I know most of you know it, but for the sake that some may not, uh, it's very simple. It's very close to our alphabet. Uh, here, it starts with an A, except they name their letters. Instead of calling it an A, they call it an alpha. But it is an A, just like our A. When you see that letter in the Greek, it's an A, and it's pronounced ah. And, and the beta is, that's a B. It looks like our capital B. And they have A, B, G, D. Remember, in the Hebrew, they have Aleph, Baeth, Gimel, Daleth. In the Greek, they've got Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, A, B, G, D. They have A, B, G, D here. So, instead of C, they have A, B, G. A, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, just remember G instead of C. A, B, G, D, and always remember the D as though you're going to come back down and make a D but instead you just curl it up. Or you can make an S with a little curl on the bottom. That's a D. And then you have two E's. You have an Epsilon. It is an E. This is a D, G, B, A. You got two E's. You got a long E. E, like met. And then you have an Eta, like, like they. But you, you have a Z, and that is a Z. It's a Z. Instead of putting the Z down at the end of the alphabet, they come right between the two E's. You've got a Z. You've got an Epsilon, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, A, B, G, D, E. And then a Z, except it's pronounced D-Z. It's, it's called a Dezeta. Dezeta. When you say Sozo. When I say Sozo, I mean Sozo. I don't mean Sozo. It is pronounced D-Z. DZ, and what's that word so? Save. It's the word save. What must I do to be sozo? Save. So you got A, B, G, D, E, Epsilon, E, Zeta, a, a DZ, or a Z, you can just call it Z, and then an Ada. And usually, Ada on the end of a word denotes that it's feminine gender. Kind of remember that. If it, like uh, the word wrath, God hadn't appointed us to wrath, O, R, G, Ada. That's feminine gender. It's what it is. So usually, either on the end of the word, sometimes wrath will be or gain, but it's still feminine. You got the Ada on the end of the word. Then you got A, B, G, D, Epsilon, Zeta, Ada, and then you have a TH. That's an unusual letter. It's not T and H. It is TH. T like th, like T H L I B O, Thalibo, narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. That's the word narrow. And uh, 
thalibo or thalipsis, the root word th, l-i-p-s-i-s, th, one letter, not two letters, one. It's called a th or a theta. So you got a, b, g, d, epsilon, e, z, eta, theta, th. Then it goes nearly just like our alphabet all the way down to here. It's basically our alphabet, except for just a couple little switches. It, it goes I-K-L-M-N. Now the X is put in the middle, right between N and O. I-K-L-M-N, X. O-P, no Q. No Q. You remember that. Remember, going from I to U is an X between N and O and no Q between P and R. Right? You understand that? It's not hard. I looks like our I. K looks like our K. That's an iota, but it's an I. It says iota, but it's an I. Kappa, that's a K. And a lambda looks like an upside down Y. I always think of an uh, L, I always think of an L like, like you take the front leg off of it and put it behind it and let it lean back on it, okay? That's the kind of way I think of it. So I say we're just going to let it lean backwards and rest a while. So, I-K-L, an M looks like an upside down H with a little hook right here. That's an M. It's called a moo. Well, it's a... Well, you can call it whatever you want to. It don't matter. <laughs> It looks like an upside down H to me, but it looks like a U to you with a little teardrop over here, right? Okay. All right. And then their N looks like our V. That's a new. Then you have a X, but it's actually pronounced K-S-E-E. -E, Kazi. You say, well, that don't make any sense. What if I said Kazilophone or Xylophone? It's pronounced like a Z or Kazi, a K and a Z. Kazi. And then you have an O. You got two O's. You got a short O, ah, and a long O, omega, on the end. So you have X, O, P. Looks like pi. Well, that's what it is. You can call it sigma pi or sigma chi or whatever you want to. We're not here to be the most proper Greek scholars in the world. We're here to find out what the Bible means. We want to know. So you got pi, just think of pi, it looks like P rho. Just think of Hank Williams, pull the P rho down the bio, right? My Yvonne. So P rho, it looks like an R. Their R looks like our P without the leg on the front of it. That's what their R looks like. It looks, it looks like our R, but you just race the, race the leg. Then you got their R. And then this is an S, sigma. But when you find an S in the middle of a word or on the front of a word, it's like the O with a little flag on the side. On the end of the word, or what they call the final S, the final S looks like our S except the bottom curl is smaller. Uh, I should have had the guy that put this up here, Bob, put that up there and put final S. That's an S, a little oval with a little flag. And then you have the T, the tau, and then the oopsilon. That's called oo. Not you, not uh, but oo. Oopsilon. So you've got I K L M N X O P no Q R S T U. Now, if you can't remember that, you must have flunked second grade. Right? Anybody can remember that, can't they? It's like falling off of a log. Then you have a PH, that's a phi, PH, I L E O. One of the words that's been ambiguously translated in the word love, PH. And then you have a CH, like Christos, being employed, or Christos, Christ, CH. And then you have a PS, that's a PZ, P S E E, PZ. And it's, it's the same letter on P S U C H I K O S. Y'all remember that word? Natural man, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. But the P.S. is one letter. Remember that. And then you have the omega, the long O. So 
once in a while I need to go through the alphabet. A, B, G, D, E, short, Z, E, long E, T, H, theta, I, K, L, M, N, X, O, P, R, S, T, U, phi, ki, z, omega. And when you want, if you want to say chi, that's fine with me. If you say I, I was in sigma chi in college, I don't care if you call it sigma chi. It doesn't matter. The, the college, it doesn't matter to me. What we're wanting to do is find out the meanings of these words. Now, I think this is about as simple as I've ever said it. Is there anything up here anybody don't understand? It's very simple, isn't it? So when you look, when you go into your interlinear Bible, and after a while, when you get used to this, used to looking at the words, you can, I can read kind of upside down, E, something, P-E. I can't see it. Yeah, anyway, it's awful little. But you get to where you can understand the alphabet there, see? Get to where you can look at it. And the reason I use the King James is I can take my King James, look up the number in the Strong's, look up the word in the Strong's, go to the original word in the Strong's and find out what the word is and then come and look up the verse in here. And I can go to the verse, find the word under the verse, the English under the verse, and look at the Greek word, and once I get a hold of the Greek word, I don't care what English word is under here, what English word is in the King James, or what English word has been written down by Mr. Strong. I'm interested in one thing. What is that Greek word? I'm not interested in anything else, because I want to know what the original text says, and I don't trust all the translators. Sometimes Mr. Green has a very ambiguous word in the English under this, because if you'll notice, this has the Strong's numbers, and he took Mr. Strong's word and put the words under there, and you can't properly translate Greek into English because you've got so many ways to spell the words. So that's, how you, that's why you want to use the interlinear, is to go and find out what the original word was, and then, after you do that, then get a, an analytical, get you an analytical lexicon and look that word up, in the analytical lexicon according to the spelling and then you can find something about the character of the word you can find out whether it's masculine feminine neuter gender you remember you remember the beast there in revelation 13 and 2 the beast was like a lion a leopard and a bear and they translated it that uh, the dragon gave him his seat his power and his authority well his his is his is the word a u t o u a-U-T-O-U. When you look up A-U-T-O-U in here, in here it will tell you, in an analytical Greek lexicon, it will tell you that it can be neuter gender or masculine. Well, how are you going to know which it is? You go into your Greek book and you're looking up these words, and they'll tell you it depends on the antecedent or when it's first mentioned, and the beast is neuter gender. But you're going to have to, that's what this is for, it's looking up what it actually means, because a lot of the translations are wrong in the, not, not just in the NIV, the NIV is a piece of garbage, is what it is. But the King James has been incorrectly translated. Now, we've said this before, what we're looking at and what we're talking about, you got a big major problem in the world today. And most people are completely unfamiliar with this. I was reading out of one of my textual criticism books, and the, one of the professors in one of the colleges said, he made the statement, he said, not hardly any seminary students in America know anything about textual criticism. And he said, not only do the students not know anything about textual criticism, he said, there's very few biblical professors in any seminaries in America that have any knowledge of textual criticism whatsoever. Is that scary? That's really frightening. They don't know anything about what text they're using. 
Now, there's two texts. What are they? Y'all tell me what they are. Textus receptus. <laughs> Willie and Harry. What? W and H. It'll always say, it'll say, let me just, Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort were two men that lived in the late 1800s, and they were scholars supposedly of sorts. But Mr. Hort, he had a vendetta against the textual Tis the Texas Receptus, since he was about 23 years old. He was on a lifetime crusade to discredit and destroy the Textus Receptus. What does the word Textus Receptus mean? It means receive text. Why was it called? Why was it called the receive text? Or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was called the received text because for about 1,600 years, it was the text that was received by the majority of the religious and religious world, and the particularly the scholars of the religious world. That was the text that was used all the way back. Uh, I believe all the way back to the apostles. And we had to prove that, and that's what we've been doing. Westcott and Hort, does anybody remember when they brought this text together? 1881. 81. Now, do you remember, do you remember the official names of this, Westcott and Hort? Well, yeah, but that wasn't the official. That's it, Vaticanus. What did y'all say? Vaticanus and Alexandria. Now, why did they call it the Alexandrian text? That's where it was. And it was, do you remember the name of the cathedral? St. Catherine's Cathedral. It was found. St. Catherine's. Now, isn't this amazing? Isn't this amazing? You got a Catholic text here and a Catholic text. I think Vaticanus would come to the Vatican, wouldn't it? And the, the first, the first, the first Vaticanus Baptist Church of Gary, Indiana, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it was in a waste basket for 1,600 years. Uh, that's what uh, Dean John Dean, uh, Dean John Virgin said. For 1,600 years, it was in a waste basket in the Vatican. And what happened? Now they call this Aleph and Beth. Now you've got all kinds of. You've got all kinds of other texts. A lot of them C and D and E and F, and you get on down and they had some with other odd names. The reason they're not the problem today is they're not using these other texts. When you're talking about the Westcott and Hort, you're talking about the text that what Bibles come from. NIV and, and what else? New England. New England Bible, Revised Standard Version, what else? American Standard, American Standard, and so on. You got all kinds of, uh, in fact, if I have Mr., he's got a whole list of them here. He's got, here's your various lists of all the different Bibles. Uh, hold on here. I think of huh, that's a piece of trash. Somebody you take to start fires with. That's what they are. <laughs> Living Bible is one man's opinion. He just simply sat down and wrote it out for himself. It's that's uh, Purple Harris Bible. What's her name? Huh? But those are those are study Bibles. That's just the way they've arranged it so you can study it. Here you've got the the MKJV, the Modern King James Version. NKJV, the New King James Version, and don't use that. That's got some messed up words. The LITV, the Literal Translation of the Bible, the MARSH, Marshall's Interlinear Greek, English New Testament, the ERV, the Easy Reading Version. Boy, we need that, don't we? Easy Reading. Yeah. <laughs> NIV, NASB, the New American Standard Bible, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, REB, the Revised English Bible, 
GNB, the Good News Bible, NAB, the New American Bible, GE, CEV, the Contemporary English Version, and JWV, the, the Kingdom Interlinear Translation, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I've got one of those. <laughs> I've got one of those upstairs, and they read like... Uh, they read kind of like uh, Donald Duck, you know. <laughs> that's how much you can understand. Hey, Jim, what about now, the that a... that's not a translation. Those are those are all particular study Bibles. You have the, you have besides this, you have the Vulgate. The Vulgate was a it was a translation from the Textus Receptus, and the Syriac Bible was from the Textus Receptus. Now. The whole key is, people say, well, what about if you live in France or Germany? The key is not what modern language is it in. The key is, what text does it come from so you can look up the Greek word? It's just like when John Calvin started studying Greek. The guy was a genius. He was brilliant. His mind just exploded with information. He was a Roman Catholic priest before he uh, joined the Reformer. Uh, Martin Luther's movement to pull out of Roman Catholicism and complain, but uh, about uh, in protest against the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Well, when, Luther, when uh, Calvin began to study the Greek, he said it just totally opened up his world. It, it makes your life completely different. And if you're going to study, when people say, well, we live in 20th century in the English version is good enough for my mom and dad is good enough for me. Let me tell you, it ain't good enough for me even though it was satisfactory to my father as a Baptist preacher. My grandfather was a Methodist preacher. My great-grandfather was a Baptist preacher. My great-great-grandfather, all of them were preachers and it's not satisfactory with me. I don't care what my father thought. I, I think I'm going to agree with God. That's what I'm going to do. Now, here's the whole, here's the whole thing. These are not the same text. I'm going to say this, and whether people like it or not, the Westcott and Hort is a perversion. It's a perverted Textus Receptus is what it is. Now, of course, we know this, and I'm getting back, to, I'm going to get in some new things on this. I want to take some time and, and say some things very slowly. Why, let me ask you, why does the world accept the Westcott and Hort text today over the Textus Receptus, which the King James Bible comes from. They say it's the oldest. That's right. But what, what is it they say is older? The manuscripts. the manuscripts. They're saying the copies are older. And, of course, they date the copies back of the Westcott and Hort, out of which you get the NIV. They date them back to when? What date? Does anybody remember? 320, 325, around there. I wonder why. I think a man named Constantine... Constantine started the Roman Catholic Church in 324, 25 A.D. at the Nicene Council. Isn't that amazing? The Vaticanus and the Alexander comes out of a Roman Catholic cathedral, and yet all the Protestants in the world are going for the Westcott and Hort. Why not? They're going for Christ's Mass, aren't they? And they're going for the whole system of Babylon, which it, Roman Catholicism uh, took on the mantle uh, there under Constantine. They're going, they've, they've gone after Roman Catholicism. And the Westcott and Hort text is a corrupt text. Not just because of the major verses that we've gone over. If you take a Westcott and Hort text, and you can take the, uh, uh, the Freiburg text, which is a Westcott and Hort. Now, you can use that to parse your words if the word is exactly the same in your interlinear Bible. The parsing will be correct for the word, but the problem is the words, they've got many, many, many words. Y'all remember how many words were left out of the Westcott and Hort text? Well, 6,500 words. <laughs> 6,500 words were left out but probably thousands of mistranslations and words that were changed. I've said it before, just like Luke 9.23. Luke 9.23, when, when, uh, when Jesus said, If any man will come after me, uh, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Well, Denai in the Westcott and Hort is A R N E O M A I. And it's the word up, A R N E O M A I, up or Naomi in the Textus Receptus. Apo means a complete self denial. Well, I think complete self denial. If we're going to completely deny self, that takes daily or every day for the rest of our life. Just to say our nail mind, that's not sufficient, is it? There has to be a constant, continual denial of self, and that's one of the one of the very key points of the Westcott and Hart. They leave out prefixes. They switch and invert words. They put certain words. And if you're reading in your Westcott and Hort or your NIV Bible, and the preacher, if you're looking at your King James, and you can kind of follow along with the preacher till a certain verse, and all of a sudden he loses you, that's because certain words are left out, and sometimes entire verses are left out of the NIV or in the, out of the Westcott and Hort text that are in the King James Bible. Now, do you remember where they, they say the... Do you remember about what the dating is? They're saying the copies go back to 320-25, somewhere in that neighborhood. <coughs> about when was the dating on the very earliest manuscripts that they can find? They would call that extant. Extant. Extant means the ones that have been revealed. What, were the ex what would be the very latest date they've been able to discover on the Texas Receptus? Around, around 375 A.D., not quite before. the. It was just the late 4th century and Texas Receptus and Westcott and Hort, the early 4th century. I, you know, I like to go into the verses that, they, that is not in here that's in here, and that's how we've nailed down and proven the authenticity of the Texas, of the Texas Receptus. Uh, but one of the things I like that they said about, that the early writers have said about the Texas Receptus, the reason they can't find any uh, earlier texts on this is because they were using them all the time and they were wearing them out. And they were printed on these papyri, and papyri is just, it's those reeds that they pull up out of the river and they beat them out and make paper out of them. And those things won't last any time. I mean, I use a Bible, it falls apart in three years, four years very maximum. And this is onion skin, and this is very good paper. Well, if you use a bunch of original copies, or if you're reading some of the autographs, the autographs had to wear out. I mean, they were gone fast. And then the copies, the copies... They were wearing out fast because no one was using the Westcott and Hort. How do we know they weren't using it? How do we know they, not Westcott and Hort, Alexandrian, the Alexandrian and the Vaticanus. How do we know they were using it? A very obvious reason. Now I'm talking about how do we know they weren't using it like in 1000 AD? How do we know that? Because this was called the received text up here. This is the one that everybody was using. They weren't even using this one back from the beginning. It wasn't received, and when they wrote these down, sure they could find something intact, because nobody was using it until they were dug up about 1859 by Mr. Hort. Nobody was using them. These were used till they were coming apart, but that's not the main reason. I want to get on to something else tonight. I didn't mean to cover this much, but I just want to ask you some questions, see if you could remember this. Now, let me erase some of this here. Now, the key to understanding of the Texas Receptus, and I am not a King James only advocate, anyone who does that, when you're reading these people that are King James only people, I've got all kinds of people that are King. Don't listen to Gail Ripplinger. Her degree is in economics, not Bible. Gail, she'll say, King James only, King James only, King James, and, and, and she talks about 100 miles an hour, is the inspired word of God. 
And it's not Hades, it's hell. Huh? Duh. I'm sorry, but hell was a hell is an English word. It was an it was actually an Irish word, and that was a trench where the Irish dug and they buried their potatoes in hell. And the Greek word Gael is Hades. Hades. Hades is the Greek word. Y'all remember the construction of Hades? How, what's the what's the word construction? You remember what it comes from? Huh? No. The construction of it. Hades, the rich men died and in Hades. The word comes from Ido. Remember that? Ido means to see or perceive. And when you place the alpha privative, first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, it negates the word and gives the opposite meaning. When you place the alpha privative, in front of it, O, it translates Hades. It means not to see or not to perceive. It means the unseen is what it means. Remember that? And let me, let me go ahead and say this while I'm here. If you don't study the men that have studied this, you're not going to understand this. Hades is the common... Hades is the New Testament word for the Old Testament word Sheol. Sheol. Hades or Sheol. This is what sometimes Hades is. The rich man died and in Hades. But in Acts, the second chapter, when Peter's preaching, he's talking about the corruption of the body of Jesus and he says, he quotes David when he says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, it actually is a reference to the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's saying you're not going to leave Jesus in the grave and see him uh, go into rigor mortis and the body stiffen and the body begin to rot. It will not see corruption and Hades is another term for the grave. You say, what? I don't understand that. Among the Jews, Sheol, it's like an umbrella. Let me give you this. Slow. I've said it real fast sometimes. But Sheol and Hades, that is, those are corresponding terms, Hebrew, Greek. That was a place, it was generic for bodies, and spirits. Thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave. In the grave, the body was unseen, wasn't it? Huh? Not seen. Well, in the grave, the soul is certainly not seen, and it's not seen upon the earth, is it? Hades or Sheol was a generic term. It could be applied to the absence of the bodies of the righteous or the unrighteous. And you, you, mean, say, you mean say, Jim, that, the, that, the, that Lazarus was in, a, was in a compartment of Hades? Yes, he was in the good part. He was in Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and was in the bad part. He was where the eternal fire was. You can say, I don't like that. Well, you're going to have to go back and correct all of the scholars because that's what is understood. It was a generic term for the Unseen spirits and unseen bodies of the righteous and the unrighteous. That's what it was. Now, that's just to show that we don't understand what this whole thing is talking about. And I don't know how, what got me there. I'm going to have to back up. Now, all right, we were talking about the text, the Texas Receptus. Now, we know that there are many verses... If you want to find the man that probably will give you more information about the uh, historical uh, valid documents of the Textus Receptus is Mr. Burgeon in this set of Unholy Hands on the Bible. This is a great set of books. He'll go in and tell you how that Westcott and Hort invented history and they were, they were involved, Westcott and Hort, 
he brings out how they were involved in Mariolatry. You know what Mariolatry is? Does anybody know what that means? Huh? It's about Mary. It's about all the miracles of Mary. When you go into... Mariolatry is, is the worship of Mary. Westcott and Hort were worshipers of Mary. They did not believe in the divinity of Christ. They were spiritualists. They had something called a ghostly guild. Even Mr. Uh, Westcott, who was probably not as bent on destroying the Textus Receptus as Mr. Hort, Mr. Westcott made the statement, he said, if the world ever finds out what we've done, they will, they'll come after us. Because what they did, they devastated the Scriptures. And of course, the Aleph and Baeth, or the Vaticanus, and the, and the, uh, the Alexandrian text, where we get the Westcott and Hort, Westcott, W and H, you got Texas or TR up here. And any time you're reading in a, in a textual criticism book, when it says TR or WH, that's what it means. Westcott and Hort. Huh? No, they were, they were, Mr. Hort was just about half heathen. He was on a, he was on some kind of, uh, of crusade to destroy Texas Receptus. He called it a vile text. Now, how is it that we found out that the Texas Receptus was the oldest text? Because of the apostolic, what you call, apostolic fathers. Anti-Nicene. Fathers, y'all know more about this than I realize. The anti-Nicene. That means before the Nicene Council. Now, why in the world would they call them anti-Nicene? That means they are before Roman Catholicism started. From, from the first century up to 325 A.D., you had the anti-Nicene fathers. They were the, these were the early fathers of the church, the fathers. At this point, when Roman Catholicism started, they took a terminology from the church. When they had a... When Peter was uh, leading the church, or when Paul was leading the church, and when Paul would leave someone in the town, he'd leave Timothy over here, at Ephesus, and he'd leave Titus in Crete. They had a term for the heads of those churches, particularly the man who was in charge of the church. What did they call him? No. Well, they did call him that, but I'm looking for a word. What did they call that they adopted in the Roman Catholic Church? They called him Pope. Mm -hmm. Pope means Papa. That's what it means, Papa. Mamma <laughs> Mia. It's a spicy meatball, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the Mama and the Papa. They called him Pope. But Pope doesn't mean, Pope does not mean Roman Catholic. It, it's an early word that meant Papa. It meant Father. I remember my father was born in 1914, and all the time I was a little bitty boy, I guess, I suppose, I don't know, back in the 40s and 50s when I was a kid, he'd refer to his daddy, we always said daddy, and he'd always call him Papa. And that, huh? Pap, Pap or Papa, I heard him call him Pap and call him Papa. And he'd say Papa this or Papa that, and Papa just means Pope is what it means. It means Papa. So, but they called that in the early church. What do they call the mothers? Mothers, the church mothers. <laughs> they called, they told them to be quiet. We ain't going to call you anything. See, we ain't gonna... <laughs> now, all right. Of course, the Texas Receptus, the early church fathers, I'm just going to say this and get to something else. This is where the corruption really began of the Textus. I'm going to show you something tonight. The Greek began to be corrupted in the early church. As these manuscripts would be written, when Paul would write 1 Corinthians, 
Or he'd write Philippians. He'd write a, a letter to the Philippians, and he was, he was in the, the time element of the Philippians. The time element of the Philippians, he was, it was Acts 28. When he was in a Roman jail, he was waiting to die when he wrote to the Philippians. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> anti <-Nicene>. Yeah. <laughs> anti Nicene, thank you. The anti Nicene, and they called him that because that was before the Nicene Council where Roman Roman Catholicism began. When Paul would write to the Philippians, when he wrote from Acts the twenty eighth chapter to the Philippians, of course he didn't know what was going to happen to this. Well once the Philippians got this letter and they wanted to share it, here's the Philippi up here. Here's Philippi right about up in here. This is the Philippian church right out here in Thessalonica over here. And this, of course, is, uh, this is uh, in the Greek world. This is over in Greece is where it is. In Corinth, Corinth is down here, down here on the end of this Peloponnesus. Well, if Paul writes to Philippi and they say, we would like to send this letter down here, they would keep the letter, but they would have some copyists sat down, and they would write out these letters. They would make copies or manuscripts. The copies were the manuscripts, and as these letters would be sent out, someone, some guys came along and evidently didn't like what they were seeing. They said, I don't like this verse. I don't guess he that believeth and baptized shall be saved, he believeth not shall be damned. I'm going to leave that out, because I don't just don't like it and don't think that's good. I don't like this baptism for salvation. Of course, they're like the people today, if some guy took that out, and they did, they don't like the idea, if anybody knew about blood baptism, maybe he thought water was baptism, and that's why he took it out. What was that he took out in Mark, the 16th chapter? Well, in Mark 16, what verses did they take out of the Westcott and Hort? Fourteen through seventy, six through nine, okay, four two three. <laughs> Mark sixteen nine through twenty is not in the Westcott and Hort text. Now it's in your NIV with a disclaimer. Always with a disclaimer in the NIV. It'll say say like so right here. Here's uh, Mark sixteen. It will say, the most reliable early manuscripts, what their references to when they say the most reliable early manuscripts, they're talking about their, the, the men who wrote this book. NIV came out in 1966. If that says anything to you. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. The most early reliable manuscripts, what they're referenced to is Aleph and Beth, or Alexandrian, and Vaticanus. That's what they're referring to. But see, whoever came out with the NIV, they don't believe the Texas Receptus is earlier. And other ancient writers do not have Mark 16, 9-20. But what that is, that is not... That's not the earliest because we proved it's not the earliest. We proved it because we've, we've already gone into early church fathers, men back in the first century, men like Polycarp. Who in the world was Polycarp? Man of the name like that, who in the world would... Does that mean many fish? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. We can laugh about his name, but this was one of the most godly men. This, whose convert was he? John the Beloved. John and Polycarp was pastoring the church where? Where did he pastor? What's on the other side of town? No. <laughs> it's Myrna. Now, and why would, why would John, why would John the Beloved, what did John write? In the Gospel of John. Yeah. Well, Smyrna's right over here on the southwestern end of what we call Turkey. They call that Asia Minor. 
Well, where was John the Beloved uh, majority of his time? He was just out here about 15 miles into the sea, Patmos right about there. And so he's sending, John's sending letters back over here, and Polycarp somewhere is in this area here, and he gets hold of one of his letters, and he becomes a convert, and he becomes a friend of John. And when John comes off of Patmos, he's traveling with him. See? So Polycarp, and we found that Polycarp has quoted, the, all, he has quoted certain of these verses that they say is not in the West Cotton Hort. And Polycarp lived, when did he live? He was a contemporary of John, and John is at the end of the first century, into the beginning of the second century, so we're long predating 325, the earliest manuscripts of the West Cotton Art, aren't we? And who was, who was uh, Polycarp's most famous convert? The, probably one of the greatest church fathers that ever lived, huh? Irenaeus. Irenaeus. And Irenaeus is quoting some... What other verses are these men quoting that we find is not in the West Cotton Horn? John 7, 53, 8, 8, 11. You looking at my notes or... I'm looking at mine. Oh, I thought you were looking at my Bible. Here's your Bible. Okay. And what, other, and what other great famous verse that verifies the Trinity is not in West God and Hort that's in the Texas Receptus. 1 John 5 and 7. 5 and 7. Now, I'm not going to go through these. I've got all kinds of testimonies from, uh, from all these. Not only do I have testimonies from Polycarp and Irenaeus, but what is, who are some of the other kids? See if y'all remember some of these. Huh? Cyprian. Who else? I have my tongue around my eyes. Ignatius. <laughs> Ignatius. <laughs> oh, no, not him. Now, let me ask you something. When I, when I see Ignatius and I see Irenaeus, particularly Ignatius, why is it we don't ever hear about him? And you hear him called Saint Ignatius. No. The main reason, the Catholics took hold of the early church fathers and they canonized, they canonized them. I don't mean they put them in canon, fired them out. They canonized them and made them saints in the Catholic church. And sometimes the Baptists or the Protestants are afraid to deal with these people when these were godly men. There wasn't anybody more godly than Irenaeus. And men like Polycarp. And men like Cyprian. These guys, and you've got in Hippolytus, and you've got all kinds of Tertullian. Now, I didn't, didn't agree right down the line with Tertullian or some of the others, but these were godly men, and they knew what it meant. They knew what a blood baptism was. If you can't afford the Anti-Nicene Fathers, which is a 10-volume set, you can get the entire 38-volume set. I've got 38 volumes, but the ones I would get are the Anti-Nicene Fathers. If you can't get that, get the... Uh, Apostolic Fathers by John Lightfoot. It's a one-volume book. Now, one thing you have to be aware of, the Roman Catholics have taken the Apostolic Fathers and they have embellished it and blown it up in some of their... You can take the facts. You can take, like when, when uh, Polycarp went to the stake, he died the martyr's death. When he, went to, when he went to the stake, and here's a man that lived in the early part of the second century, 120, 25, when he went to the stake, we've talked about how that they weren't eating crackers and drinking grape juice in the 26th chapter of Matthew. They were eating the Passover. And to drink of a cup meant to undergo a violent death. Well, they knew this. When Polycarp came to the stake, they, it was said that he kissed the stake and said, Now I will drink the cup of my Lord. He didn't mean to pass the grape juice, did he? Yeah. It's not now that is heavy. These guys knew the truth about the cup, about baptism. I like what Ignatius said. He said, Oh, that I may be ground in the teeth of wild beasts, that I may be found to be pure bread. Whew. We being many are one bread. You want to know 
about the truth of the Scriptures. Read these guys. Be found pure bread? What do you mean by that? When Jesus said, this bread, this is my body, they acted out their contracts when they had a contract, and this was the blood of the New Testament. Testament meant a contract. It was the same thing as berit in the Old Testament. It meant a covenant or contract. And when he said, this bread is my body, God said, I change not, shama. I never, or shana, he said, I never change. I don't mutate or duplicate. I don't have two bodies. He said, this represents my church, this bread. When Ignatius said, oh, that I may be ground in the teeth of wild beasts, that I may be found to be pure bread. You think he didn't know what that meant? Baptists don't know. But he knew when Paul said, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, evil men were called beasts or wild beasts. Just, you're going to have to study these guys. I've got a, somewhere over here. I don't know if I have it down here. I probably got it upstairs. But I got a, I got a book that's got all these quotations of these guys. I don't think I brought it down. But it's got the quotations of these fathers. And they would speak of drinking the cup and drinking, drinking a, a, a poison at the altar of God. And they would talk about drinking the cup and, and, uh, and the, they talk about what these things actually meant, what we teach here at Grace and Truth Ministries. Now, of course, you had uh, all these early church fathers, and we find them quoting. We find them quoting these and many more verses, but these are, these are some of the most significant. And I've said before, I love what, I love what Dean Burgeon, Dean, he was a dean of college. When I say dean, I don't, his name was John Burgeon. But he, is, but he was a dean. And what I like about what he does here, look here. The 12 verses of Mark, look what, he, look what he dedicates in this book to it. Right here. Hold on. The last 12 verses according to the Gospel of Mark. Mark 16, 9 through 20. And that's not in the West Cotton Hort text. He dedicates, in proving that it's in the text, this is what he, last 12 verses of Mark. Do you think he's got anything to say just about those 12 verses? Out of all, I'm, I'm taking big hunks of, look at that. Last 12 verses of Mark, he dedicates that much of his book, of one of his books. I think he thinks that's important, don't you? And he nails these guys to the wall. But here's what's very sad. Dean Burgeon was called the champion of lost causes. You know why? He was trying to save Textus Receptus. And he's lost the battle because the world has turned to that hellish Westcott and Hort text. And most, like I said earlier, most people don't know. They don't even know that Texas Receptus, King James Bible, comes from a completely different text than the NIV. In the most popular Bible in the world, they probably sell 80% of NIVs above everything else. And it's a hellish text because it's not just these are left out. When there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, these three are one. This is a verification in the Textus Receptus, and this is quoted by church fathers that lived long before 325, the first manuscripts that are found of the Alexandrian and the Vaticanus. Does that bother anybody besides me? But here's what's really scary. Do you think this is where the corruption of the Bible began? <laughs> what was the first corruption? Well, I won't say the first, but what is the major corruption that Jesus had to deal with in his day? The Pharisees. But what was it that they... Now, the Old Testament... Huh? That's it. Well, sure it is. Halakha and Haggadah, right? 
Halak on Haggadah. Now, let me tell, show you the man that... Let me show you the man that's going to really give you more straightening. Here's the books when you want to start studying Halakha. Right here. Right there. Now, that'll, that'll start you. Then go into your... Let me write some words on the board for you. Huh? This is John Lightfoot. Commentaries on the New Testament from the Talmud and Hebraica. When you see, this is going to nail the hide on the wall of these people that have corrupted the text. Most people do not know the acts that Jesus was grinding. What was the Old Testament text called? No, I mean the uh, Torah. No, no. What, that was, what was the Torah? I'm not talking about Torah, Torah, Torah. The first five books, Torah. Torah is good. When you hear the Jews talk about Torah, that's good. Talmud, bad. Talmud, bad. <laughs> Talmud, bad. Talmud, bad. Good. Good Torah. Good, bad Talmud. I think that's what uh, Frank, Frankenstein's monster, Boris Karloff, said. Good, good, far bad. Good coffee. Torah is an uh, Torah. Yeah, Torah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of Torah, Torah, Torah. I'm thinking about the Japanese yeah. bombing Pearl Harbor, yeah. <laughs> so Torah is good. First five books. One, two, three, four, five. What is another word for Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? That's what we call P-E-N-T-E-U, Pentateuch. T-E-U-C-H. Pentateuch, Pent means five, first five books of the Bible. That's what it is. Now, what was the, all the Old Testament called? What's the official term when they translated that text into English? You've heard me say it. It starts with an M. The Maseratis, the Maseratis, or Masoretic text, that, is, that means to be handed down from generation to generation is what it means. Now, what the Pharisees did, where did the Pharisees come from? Uh, Solomon's, I mean, Samuel's... Uh... Well, yes, they, they did. They were taught by the schools. But what, what was their ancestry? Well, yes, but how did they trace back? Well, they were called the rabbis. Rabbis in the Babylon, Babylonian synagogue. In the Babylonian synagogue, sin garage. In the Babylonian synagogue, where did the synagogue come from? Why was it? What was it? What does synagogue mean? Does anybody remember? It means to gather together. It means assembly of God. I mean, God's assembly. That's where the assembly of God gets their name. Except that's not a good thing to name yourself after. Not the synagogue. Synagogue. S U N. A G O G E. Synagogue. Soon means. Soon means fellowship or with or to assemble together. And A G O means to lead together. Assemble together is what it means. Now, that's where the synagogue comes from. Now, the synagogue, why was the synagogue begun? Where was it begun? In it started in Babylon. Now, who started in Babylon? No, Nebuchadnezzar didn't start the synagogue. <laughs> the Jews started it. The Jews and the men that were in head of it were the men. Why? Why are the Jew, What are the Jews doing in Babylon? They were carried captive in Second Chronicles, the thirty-sixth chapter, thirty-six. They were carried into captivity, and when they get there, they don't have. What is it they don't have there that they had back? They didn't have the temple, and the temple was the only place you could offer sacrifice. 
And who was in charge of the temple? The high priest. High priest. And who were the priests in Israel? What tribe of Israel? They were Levites. Levi was, what son was he? <laughs> Jacob's third son. Jacob's third son. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And the Levites were the priesthood. They took care of the temple and everything. Well, when they were carried away, because for 500 years they didn't, they didn't serve God, for 500 years they went after Baal, and who was? And his name was? And his name was in... His, one of his generic names was Hercules, and his birthday was December 25th. Okay. Okay. Now, I just thought I'd... Everyone together. December the 25th. All right. Now, when they were carried into captivity, you could not offer sacrifices anywhere but the temple. They had a daily sacrifice offered in the, in, on that altar. They could offer them in Israel. But they considered this a filthy land over here, and God had destroyed the temple... And he'd taken all of the, Nebuchadnezzar carried all of the vessels of the house of the Lord into captivity. They didn't have a temple. They had no vessels. So what did they do? They organized the synagogue in Babylon. That's where they started it. And what they used to call themselves the Levites here, they started and called themselves rabbis over here. And rabbi means what? Well, it means master, actually a master, or you can call him a teacher, but he's a master, a master teacher. They started calling him rabbis, and then as they came out of Babylon, they came back to Israel, and they brought synagogue worship with them, and whatever the synagogue became in Babylon, whatever the synagogue became, that's what it became when they came back to Israel, when they... When they came back to Israel, the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the old rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. That was the old Levitical priesthood. So what the world worships today, what crucified Jesus was a Pharisee Babylonian system. In fact, in Revelation, the 11th chapter, the Bible says that, that it was... We'll look at it over here, Revelation 11. I'll let you read it. That's what he's talking about when he says here in Revelation 11. Speaking of the dead bodies of the two witnesses, which is the church. It's not Moses and Enoch, Moses and Elijah. Verse 8, And their dead bodies, the church, as they're being martyred, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. They had the nature of Sodom and Egypt, where they worshipped all these idols. Yeah, verse 8. So when it's talking about the system that crucified Jesus, and, and in Will Durant's, in Will Durant's History of Civilization, he tells us that all of the different sect, sects, you all remember the word sect? But do you remember the Greek word? Huh? No. <laughs> sect. The sect of the Pharisees. What, what's the word? Does anybody remember? Heresies. We get the word heresy from that. It means a sect is where you set up a boundary and you set your own laws in it. And that's called a heresis or a heresy. And it was a legitimate term in the first century. It meant to choose. It means to choose by setting up your own boundary or to have one's own free will. How's that? Huh? That's what the word sect means, heresies. 
They say, you set up on, what's God's, what's God's heresy? I did a predestination tape one night and I talked about God's heresy. God's heresy is his whole rizzo, isn't it? He chooses to set his border, his boundary. A denomination is a heresy. It was a legitimate term. It meant to set your own boundary line by your own free choosing. It means to pick by choice. It means to choose. You've not chosen me. I've chosen you, he said. You can't have your heresy. So when there, people are talking about heresy, they don't even know what that... Or heretikos. You remember heretikos? H-A-I-R? H-A-R-E-T-I-K-O-S? Heretikos, that's the word heretic there. And when a man, after the second admonition, if he's a heretic, that means he's involved in his own free will. and says, I don't care what the Bible says. I want to believe what I think it means. My father's a Baptist. I'm going to believe I accept Christ. And if you don't like it, I, he's a heretic. Heretic doesn't mean somebody that, that offers chickens on, in some little hut out here, some little witch's cover. A heretic is one who by his own choice says, I'll define this for myself. What? What? That's, yeah, I think you're right. Because why would we be conforming out of something that we don't have to be conforming out of? You know? D no mos. D no mos. No mos is the word. D means to set off or set off a law. It means to set by boundaries. It's a denomos. De de it means to set off, a boundary. Nomos is the Greek word law. When a man sets off his own law, he's got a denomination. He's got a sect. And he's a heretic. Baptists are heretics. <laughs> Methods are heretics. We go by the law of God only. And people will say, what church are you affiliated with? No, they mean, what denomination, what heresy are you with? So when somebody calls us a heresy, it's kind of like calling us cult. They mean occult, that means to cover up. Cult means to cultivate. They don't even know what to call you. Hey. Yeah, I guess. We, we are in God's heresy, aren't we? I got a predestination tape called God's heresy. And that's good. Now, now look here. Here's the thing. In Babylon, here's something that happened. Let me write some words on the board. Midrash. Mishnah, Targum, T-A-R-G-I-M, Targumum, Targumum, Talmud. All of this started back, the Midrash started back during this time period here. Or the Mishnah. Now, I've got a Mishnah upstairs. I'll bring it down one night. The Mishnah was what they had put together. And Let me read a little bit about the, the, about the Midrash and the Mishnah. Mishnah was the code of Jewish laws arranged about the year A.D. 200 or 220 at Tiberias in Palestine by Rabbi Jehuda surnamed Haggadosh. The title is by some understood as importing second, like the rabbinical code being second or next to the Pentateuch. It was second to the Pentateuch, second to the Pentateuch, and all the corruption of, all the corruption of the Masoretic text took place from the time that Jews were taken captive until, they, until the time of Christ. And what they did, the reason it's called second to the Pentateuch is because they started something in Babylon that developed through this system right here. Whenever I say Talmud is corrupt, the Talmud comes out of these, the Targumum or the Targum, the Mishnah and the Midrash. These were systems of written laws they had a written law and a they had a written law and a 
verbal law. Uh, how much time do I have, Mike? I need to know how far. Where, huh? 20. Let me show you this. What was the written law called? Halakha. H A L A K A H. Halakha. That was the verbal law. Now, but it wasn't a law. It was called a tradition. It was a tradition. Well, I'm going to do that. Let, give me time. Okay. Hold on. Now, that was halakha. That was verbal law. That was a tradition or a paradosis. And paradosis, that means something that's handed down from one generation to the other, like Christmas, Ishtar, birthday, whatever, All Hallows' Eve or Samhain or whatever you want. It was a tradition. Now, where did this tradition start? It started here in Babylon, and these guys got their imagination going. Here's what they had. They had... They had a head rabbi. He was the rabbi. He was called the, the rabbi of the great synagogue. They had many rabbis, but they had a head rabbi, and he was equivalent to the high priest. And usually they would try to come up and get somebody who was in the high priest lineage, but the tribes had become so mixed they couldn't always do that. So he was the head rabbi. Here's what he would do. They had one other thing they called the Haggadah. H-A-G-G-A-D-A-H. And that was commentaries or comments. What they, what they had invented in Babylon, they said because the Old Testament in the Pentateuch, in Torah, they said because, because repeatedly in Torah, the Bible will say, tell this unto your children, unto your children's children, concerning the Passover, Day of Atonement, delivery from uh, Egypt, tell it to your children, to your children's children. They said that the verbal law was a commandment of God that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So they said they had a verbal law when they left when they left Egypt and went to Mount Sinai, they had a verbal law and here's Moses standing up here on the mountain. And they're saying that God gave him two tables of the law, the commandments, and he gave him all the Levitical law that they're going to have to live by as Levites in the temple. And that God came down here and spoke to Moses and gave him a verbal law. They called that halakha. And they gave it to him and said, you give it to the generation simply because that is spoken time and time again in the Torah. So they took that when God would say, tell it to your children's children, they would not only come up and say these things, they said, they started inventing their own verbal law in Babylon, and each head rabbi, as he would step down and he'd give his position to the incoming rabbi, all the time he was the head of the Babylonian synagogue, he would, he would come up with his own ideas about how the law was to be interpreted and then he would pass this verbal understanding. And if you had a nut in here, and he started passing down a bunch of his verbal ideas and saying, God spoke to me and said, this is the way the law is to be interpreted. This is where the original corruption of this text goes to. Why wouldn't there be a corruption of New Testament? There's a corruption of the Old by the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the Bible toters. They were the Baptist preachers of their day, weren't they? I give Baptists a hard time. I was raised a Baptist. Because I am so... And I say that because at one time when I was a kid, I believed the Baptist to be a 
The Baptists in 1850 taught the doctrines of predestination, all the seminaries, all the preachers. It was Baptist doctrine. Baptist was it? Huh? Yeah, I was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you said that just like that. Yep. Well, and the reason I believe it is because when you read Southern Baptist and the doctrine of election, whether they like it or not, B.H. Carroll, probably the savior of the Southern Baptist, the man who started uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, he was a powerhouse on predestination. J.C. Boyce, one of the great early Southern Baptists, he believed in the doctrine of predestination. All of these guys at Southern Seminary, when you were when you were going to be teach at Southern Seminary in the 1800s in Louisville, you had to sign a statement that if you did not preach the doctrines of predestination, that was the reason for your termination. Now, that's the truth. And that's, and people say, well, why is it the Baptists knew the truth back then, and why is it they don't know it now? Why is it the Jews knew the truth back here and they didn't know it during Jesus' day? Because it had been corrupted over time. Truth is always corrupted by the world. Now, I'm going to give you this. So, when you get in Haggadah and Halakha, Halakha is the verbal law. Let's go over here and look at this verbal. Let's go look at it in Matthew, the fifth chapter. And if you don't know this, you have to look at Matthew 5. Jesus... This is his first message in northern Israel. He has never met the Pharisees. He met them in the temple when he was 12, but he hasn't really confronted them. He knows what they believe. He was raised with Jewish religion. And he tells us about the Halakha, and Mr. Lightfoot will show you. Mr. Lightfoot, will sh he'll go through... The Gospels, now he don't give you everything, but he covers more than anyone else I know on what this means. Now, look here in Matthew, the fifth chapter. He gives a direct, he alludes directly to the Halakha, verbal law. The Pharisees were running the, was running the synagogue in, in the head of the temple. How in the world... Could they have a temple during the days of Jesus when, when Nebuchadnezzar carried him into captivity, he carried all the vessels, the Ark of the Covenant was gone, it was all gone. You can't have a Day of Atonement without an Ark of the Covenant. Modern day Judaism. The only thing Mr. Durant, Will Durant in his story of History of Civilization says, the only people of the Various sects that survived. What are some of the other sects? The Essenes, the Sadducees, the Herodians. You had all these different sects, and the only ones that survived was the Pharisees. Judaism of the 20th of the 19th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century Judaism, when you go to a synagogue out here on West End, that is Pharisee Judaism. That is not Old Testament Judaism. When someone comes out of Judaism and they keep wearing their little yarmulke and they say, I got saved, I'm a Messianic Jew. And, and they go on some TV and everybody lifts them up a little higher than everybody else. They're lifting up Pharisee Judaism. Pure religion, an undefiled religion, threskia, T-H-R-E-S-K-E-I-A, ritual, pure ritual before God and the Father is this. Pure ceremonial observant is not wearing yarmulkes, partaking in a literal Passover. It's not Christ's mass and giving each other gifts. Pure religion is to visit the fatherless and the widow in your affliction, in their affliction, and keep yourself unspotted from the world. I'm not trying to give so-called Messianic Jews a hard time. Well, I guess I am. You people quit lifting yourselves up. First of all, you ain't got no business wearing that little yarmulke or keeping any of that Pharisee Judaism you're keeping. 
Pharisee Judaism is going on in the, in the synagogues around America, that is not Old Testament. They've got it mixed up in there. They got some truth and some lie and no Ark of the Covenant and no Levites and no... If you don't have an Aaronic priesthood, how can you be a Jew without offering a lamb about 6 o'clock every morning, 6 o'clock every evening? You ever known him that did that? Pharisee Judaism. What it was, it was a development, and he starts off condemning them here in the fifth chapter. Here he is in northern Israel. The first thing he does is stretch his arm all the way down to southern Judah and slap them right in the mouth. And he hasn't even gone in and confronted them yet. He's in northern Israel preaching here on the Sermon of the Mount. Look here, let's go down here and read it. Look at verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Why would they think that? Because he's going to come in, and this is some of his first words, and he's going to destroy the traditions that pollute the law. He says, don't you think I've come to destroy the law and the prophets? I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily, and it reminds me, the end of the law is Christ. Christ is the end of the law. Well, not end. That's not the word. The word is T-E-L-I-O-T-E-L-O-S. It means completion. And he's completing the law daily in our lives. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt agape thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Now look here. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle. Now why is... <laughs> Don't look at me. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Why is he saying this? Because they've been making it up as they go along. That's right. A jot is the yod. He said, you don't you dare leave out one yod. That's the smallest letter of the, of the Greek alpha, of the Hebrew alphabet. Now here's the Hebrew alphabet right here. A tittle. Here's a tittle. On the bath. Here you got a bath and a cough. The cough looks just like the bath, but the bath's got a tittle on it. Look here. The bath. Let me erase this. And you're not even going to understand the Gospels unless you understand the Halakha and the Haggadah. Not even going to know what it's about. Because it starts alluding to the Haggadah. Here's a bath. And here's a cough. And what's the difference? That one's clear. That's that tittle, that's all right here. And these are supposed to be exactly the same. Except this right here, that's a tittle. It changes a K to a B. And he said, you Pharisees have done this. Now watch what he says. He is alluding to the Pharisees and what they have done in Babylon, in the synagogue to the Holocaust and Hagadah. Let's read on. One jot or one tittle. In fact, in, in here, he'll tell you whenever you look up, thou shalt not have many wives, you change one tittle on one word and it says thou shalt have many wives. That's it. And the Jews said, even they themselves said, if you change the word of God, you destroyed the world. Now let's read on. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. What is a least commandment? What's the least commandment? What are we talking about? A tittle or a jot or a yod. If you break the least commandment of changing the yod or the tittle... What he says, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. If you believing preachers do that, but whosoever shall do and teach them the jots and the tittles, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, who have not only changed the jots and tittles, they have inserted a verbal law called the halakha. 
They said it was given to Moses and passed down from generation to generation. Ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. The word means not at all enter. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. By who? Who are we talking about in the previous verse? No. What did we do? He just got through saying, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you have heard that it hath been said by them in their halakha of old time, they changed my words by inventing a verbal law. That's what he's saying, isn't he? Now, you have to understand something that's going on here. There's two sets of people here in Matthew 5. <clears throat> when he starts correcting the Pharisees and the scribes, the scribes were, let me, you know what the scribes were. The word scribe is the word sophron. Those were the lawyers. When the Bible says, warn you doctors and lawyers, it's not talking about a guy who practices law down here, civil law in some court downtown Nashville. The lawyers were the scribes. They did the same things with the Old Testament that the copyists did when they would make these manuscripts. They would sit and write the law all day long, making copies of it, giving them to people. They knew the law. If there's anybody that knew the law, it was the scribes. They wrote it constantly. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. When is old time? Back in the synagogue in Babylon. Under their halakha, when they were in Babylon inventing a verbal law. You have heard that it hath been said by the Pharisees when they were the rabbis. That whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. And they've added to my words, but I say, when he says, but I say, who would have the authority to correct the Pharisees, saying they had twisted the word of God? God himself, what Jesus is saying in essence, when Moses was on the mountain, Moses was on the mountain. He was on the mountain with me. I didn't say that. I'm God. I was there. I said it. I created it. It was me. But I say it's saying, I'm God. I didn't say any such thing. See, they twisted the word of God. But I say that whosoever, he said it's stiffer than that than killing. The law is a lot stiffer than that. But I say unto you, here's the law of God, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. And constantly the scripture will talk about, David will say they hated me without a cause. Jesus said there in the... In the 15th chapter of John, they hated me without a cause. Didn't he say that? Look at it. John 15. The corruption has always been here. As soon as men get in charge and get in control, they begin this, don't they? Corrupt the word. This is quoted from Psalm 69 and 4, but verse 25 but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. He was constantly confronting the Pharisees. They hated me without a cause. Are we to ever hate anyone? We're not. <laughs> yeah, sure we do. Didn't God say, didn't Romans 9 say, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated? Didn't, didn't constantly David say he hates evil men who do evil works? Now, if we could pick them out, if we could pick out all of the vessels of wrath, we could just out and out say, get out of my life, get away from me, you low-down devil. If God just make all the elect 
blue. And all of the vessels of wrath, make them red, because they're going to hell, and that's the color of the, of the devil's. Name. Make them red. Make, or make them pink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then, then we'd know, wouldn't we? Now, but I say, are we supposed to be angry with people? Well, yes. Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and sin not. And it's about the winds of doctrine, what they're doing to God. Are we to be angry and hate men? Yes, for when they pollute the word of God. Wait a minute, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Look here. You have to understand this. I'm out of time. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm come back because I've got to go through this whole thing. I've got to go through this whole chapter. There's one thing I'm going to show you before we leave. You've got two sets of people being talked about here. You have the blessed ones. Blessed ones. And you have the Pharisees. And Jesus hasn't even gone to southern Judah yet. He's reaching. Can you see his long arm here? He's standing on, he's standing on a mountain here in northern Israel. Northern Israel, up close to the Sea of Galilee. And he's reaching down about 80 miles or 100 miles into southern Judah going home. Slapping him right in the mouth, and the blood just trickling down the mouth of the head of the. I mean, oh, they, the word's going to get there before him because he starts off saying, You're halakha, you are liars. And he confronts all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John every time he deals with the Pharisees. He's dealing with them with their traditional law, and they've made their tradition such so they can live the kind of lifestyle that they desire. Just like, Just like today. And they pulled it. Yeah. Yeah. Now look, but just look here. All I'm going to do is show you this. I'm not going to go into it, but I'm going to come back next week. But just look at, look down here in verse 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, right? Look on down here. Verse 31, it hath been said. Verse 33, again, ye have heard that it hath been said by the Pharisees of old time in their halakha. He starts his ministry by correcting their lives. And they're not even there. He says, what he's doing here, the, here he is up here among the Amharets of the people of the soil in northern Israel. And they, down in southern Judah, they consider these people up in Samaria a bunch of dogs, a bunch of swine pigs, and they'll spit on them if they get close enough because they call them half-breeds, intermixed with the Assyrians when they came in and they never did get any laws to come back. Yeah. He was born in uh, Bethlehem, Judah anyway. Yeah, and he was born in Bethlehem, Judah, and they called Jesus a Samaritan. Because he lived in Nazareth up in Galilee. That's right. So the self-righteous people are these religious Baptists down here. <laughs> Can we call them Southern Baptists? Yeah, Southern Baptists. They're Southern Baptists. That's it. Southern Baptists. That's the, that's the righteous, the self-righteous. So when he starts off, he starts off his ministry correcting their verbal laws. I think that's all these preachers have got in these churches is verbal laws, isn't it? Now, I've got a whole lot to say on this. Y'all just hang with me. I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to leave you hanging until next week. Oh, and it hath been said. Don't worry about it. it hath been said, but I say, he's saying, I was on the mountain with Moses. I was the God that was there. Don't tell me I said that. Because I was there. I've got the tape right here. Yeah. Now, I'll come back and give the answers to this. We're talking about the corruption of Scripture, textual criticism, what we've got to do is critique Old Testament and the great criticizer was Jesus of how they had polluted his word. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to understand that there's a truth that we need to grasp and it comes from your original word and your original text. May we continue to study. Lord, open this up for us as we study this pollution that the Pharisees did to your word. 
God will praise you, Lord. Thank you for truth. We give you praise and glory for all things in Christ's name. Amen.